Welcome back to the podcast. We are so excited to bring you today's guest. It was such a pleasure of witnessing her on stage at Unite the Light. It was the first time I'd ever heard of her. And funny enough, she was sitting at our table before she went on to the stage. So I feel like the universe was like, you have to meet. And we had the pleasure of doing that at an amazing conference. And Dana Claudette is a modern feng shui master and a creative catalyst, which is a like soul sister after my own heart, multi-passionate and using your own story of hitting rock bottom in to holy shit, how do I transform my life? And now that I have those tools, how do I help others? So your journey was so inspiring, such a mirror, and that's exactly why we wanted to have you on today's show. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It was so amazing to meet you. And I met you under the weirdest circumstances. I wasn't going to go to Unite the Light because my dog had literally passed away the day before I got on a plane, like not even a full day. And so I was in a haze and it was when I met you guys, I was going to stay home that day. And then I met you guys and I was like, I need to just go. I feel like I'm being pushed by the universe out into this world. So thank you. And you are such a joy and both of you such lights. Oh my gosh, you literally glow. And that is exactly the mantra that I live by, shining from the inside. And when I saw you on stage sharing your wisdom, it was very clear to me that the level of depth that you bring to your teaching and sharing doesn't come easy. And it's not for the faint of heart. So can you just take us back on a journey? Because we're just getting to connect with you and know you. So I want to hear your story, like girlfriends on the phone, like what the fuck is up? What, how'd you get here? Because I know, I know it was a roller coaster. <laughs> it was definitely, it was definitely, uh, I'll say, you know, some people say you have a destiny or you have a something. It was definitely not anything that I had intended and I could never come up with this in my head. I was in LA, I was working, um, doing like 10 million creative things. It was pre really popular internet. This was like back in the early 2000s. And I was working at art galleries and hosting music shows like early internet and doing all these different things. And I was doing so much self help at the same time, but I wasn't doing it from a place of empowerment and growth. I was doing it because like deep inside from when I was a little kid, I felt different and I felt somewhat broken. And I thought that if I could just figure it out, and believe me, I figured out a lot of things. I figured out how to get out of the small town in Jersey I lived in. I figured out how to have like a pretty amazing life. I got myself like to Stanford. I got myself to all these different things. And then when I had to get out into the real world, it was like, I'm screwed. Like I don't function here. Within confines, I can function, but what do I do? And so I just determined that everyone else was programmed a certain way and I was faulty. And so I figured if I could figure out what was broken about me, then I could finally thrive. And so I went all in. Like I, when I say like, oftentimes you hear someone moves to Hollywood, then they wind up like at rock bottom and you think of drugs and alcohol. It was like, no, I was like doing massive cleanses and all sorts of crazy nutritional things and mindset things. and everything all day long from morning to night in the most intense way with this drive to somehow like push myself to the limit and finally break free of all the stuff in my way and i did break into the hospital i broke into an autoimmune disease i wound up with all sorts of things that weren't even talked about at that time no one was talking about these things and so I was like, no instruction manual, no way to figure it out. And so when I say like rock bottom, it was like no health insurance, 145, six, $7,000 in debt, which at that time was like a crazy, a lot of money. And then couple it with like no job, no clue what I was going to do. And I was sick. And the only thing I was given was like a handfuls of pills saying you have to take these for the rest of your life. And I just, in me, something was like, no. And I don't know why, because normally I'm very compliant with what people tell me, but I was like, no, no, this is not the way it's supposed to be. And so I 
really got back to basics and it started with my home. And because I got in so much trouble hiring other people to help me, not because there's anything wrong with hiring people to help you, but because I was in such a self deficiency that I was bringing people in to like tell me what to do. I was like, uh-uh, I'm gonna figure this out myself. So I started clearing clutter and organizing and this was again not in the ethos i just knew i had to like very elementally figure things out i got back to my spiritual practice with intensity and i step by step i was just figuring things out and i was going to hire someone to do feng shui because i'd heard about it and it was like nope i'm gonna just learn it so i started learning and i started applying things but applying them through the lens of what was right for me, which was very different from feng shui, which is uh, most of you have heard of it. It's like, this goes here, this goes here, this is just the way it is. And I was like, no, I am not going to accept that anymore. I am going to do things and start to understand what I'm doing. And so I literally started for me and then I started sharing it with friends and family because my life turned around so dramatically as I was organizing my environment. It was helping me to organize my mind and to stop torturing myself, if for lack of a better word. And then it just expanded and it was all for fun. I still had jobs, a whole career. I was doing all kinds of things. And I, it just, I got on Tumblr early for fun not to start Tumblr. a business. Tumblr, Tumblr. OG. Yeah, OG <laughs> Tumblr. And it blew up and it became a big thing. And it just all was not, it wasn't like, hey, hire me. I was literally pulling people in for free, for fun, to do consultations and see if what I was doing actually worked. Because I was tearing apart like a lot of the strict structure of something. And just because it worked for me, doesn't mean it's gonna work for you. So people were like, why don't you do this as a job? I was like, cause I don't know if it works. So I tested it out for years and years and years with so many counsel, num countless numbers of people for free, for fun. And then all of a sudden I was like, just pushed. It got to a place where I was like, I am wasting my time being at a job. Like people are asking me to do this. Maybe I just have to just go and do it. And that was the start of everything. So it was, it was definitively not something that I could have like been like, hmm, okay, I don't have a job. Let me think feng shui. Like, no, it was like, I, this is not anything that I planned. That sounds so much like my tarot journey. I'm not like, hey, I'm a professional tarot reader and I can talk to the dead. Like I would have, I don't think, I know I signed up for that, but I don't think I would have signed up for it had I known that I was signing up for it. You know, it's, it, there's such a beautiful story and there's so many important pieces that I think would help so many people on the journey. One of them is that ambition is a very double-edged sword. It's very easy to get burnt out. So if, if you want to be in the top percentage of something, if you want to strive to be the best in anything and you throw yourself into something, you have to deal with the stress management. The other part that's really, really big is that most of us, I wish this weren't the case, but most of us have to hit a rock bottom point to really get the idea across. For some reason, we're stubborn and bullheaded. I think it's wave one and two light workers that had to hit rock bottom because my message is like, please don't wait till rock bottom to make a change. Your intuition has been nudging you for a long time. You've just been ignoring it. <laughs> Another important part is that the intention behind everything is so important. Like, like you, you mentioned, you can do all the personal development, you can do all the self-development you want in the world, but if you feel incomplete, nothing will be able to, there, there's no, there's nothing that can go into that hole. It has to be something that you decide on your own. It has to be something where you feel it and say, no, I am worthy, but I, I want to improve. I want to get better at these little bitty things. Like th there's so many beautiful lessons in your journey. And I think that's so often why we have to share what our transformation is because other people can pick up on it and it can make their journey so much easier. That's, that was beautiful. I mean, it's like the universe 
has a calling for you and it's what taking a leap of faith looks like. And can you talk about like, obviously your life has been this journey of intention. So it's only fitting that your program would be called the school of intention. Can you talk about how that was created when the spirit was nudging you? How long did you ignore it? And all, you know, all the things that went into birthing that project. I ignored it for a really long time. I knew I had a unique method. I understood that. But I think for everyone, it's, uh, again, I have a thing. I had, I talked about this at Unite the Light. I went to a numerologist who's very well known now, Josh Siegel. And he, at the time, was at Bodhi Tree in Los Angeles, this little psychic bookstore place that's no longer there, but it was such a gem. And he looked at me, looked at my numbers and said, like, until you can 100% guarantee that what you do works, you will not do this professionally. But once you can it's going to be sky's the limit. And I was like, you really get it. Like, that's exactly what I'm going through. But to hear someone else say it was just like, oh, it's even in my numbers. It's like, it's what I have to do. So it was a really long time. It was bringing thousands of people, tons of clients, thousands of people into my smaller programs and working with them and getting them to a point where so many people were asking, like, I want to do this. How do I learn all of it? How do I get all the things? And I was like, no. <laughs> and I just kept saying no and no and no until it was maybe four or five years until someone cornered me at an event in San Diego and said, you told me no before, but I'm going to ask you again, will you please teach me? And I just said yes. And I was driving home with my friend and I was like, if I'm going to teach one person, do you think I should maybe offer it to a few other people who've done some of my work. And she was like, yeah, it's probably going to be easier because one person, that's a lot of work. I was like, yeah, it is. And so I asked a few people and they were like, yeah. And I asked a few more. And then I was just like, I think this is the school. I'm going to do it. But then the process of actually taking what you do and for anyone who does anything, the thought of having to reverse engineer the process of what you do and understand it well enough to translate it to someone else is really a trip and you learn so much and get so much better at what you do and even if you don't plan to teach what you do it's so helpful when you're looking to improve to actually try to reverse engineer your process so that you can see the components and see where they can get better and where they can get sharper because even the way I talk about what I do has changed since the school started because I understand all the random intuitive things I've been doing so much more since 2018. Oh my God, like you are speaking to the choir right now because I literally went on that same journey of experimenting all of my self-love and empowerment practices and tools and rituals on all my hair clients while I was working in the salon. And after years and years of experimenting, pulling tarot cards and just like using them as a guinea pig, I realized that I was repeating myself over and over again and that there were having these major results from these certain projects or rituals or different aspects, the way that they approach their mindset or even doing forgiveness work, like diving down into inner child stuff. Like it was not just balayage and highlights anymore. We, we really got into it. And that gave me the sacred space and the um, creative space as well to be able to come up with like, what is the program that has helped me to transform and that's how i birthed shine school so literally hearing how yours was created and of course resistance and all the things it took me two years to create it because like you said you have to like reverse engineer go back to the beginning and and embody that live that with intention if these are the types of programs we're creating it's not like how to quilt like okay we'll show you like a cross stitch here and then we're done like and we go do whatever the hell we want like this is a like you're a living testament to the work and the foundation that you put out there and the message and reminds me of so much of where you're at in your process as a hypno as a hypnotist he's creating a certification teaching all the step by step on how to do self hypnosis how to do it for your clients and do transforming work and you're having to go back to the beginning we're like this is 20, 30 years in like yeah but do, do you notice that as you as you sort of bring about what your own personal formula is for success do you notice that while there are a million nuances you discover, the actual main process is very simple. Like the, the concepts are typically simple. Like they're very easy. When I think about how could I teach this to somebody, I've done it so many times, there's so much different stuff, but like 
the basics are always the basics. And I feel like if, if you focus on getting really good at those, like there's so much in life that you can be a part of. And then all the experimental stuff you're going to end up doing anyways, because you're going to screw up. You're going to screw up the basics and you're going to figure out why you screwed up. You're speaking my language. It's funny because when I first opened the school, and this is a feng shui thing that everyone can look at in their own home. When I first started, I was like, the only way to do this is for the first, the first part of it to be about your literal self, not even your home. And there's so much about yourself, your energy, and all of these things before we move or touch anything in a home. And people were messaging me for, for like a full month, like, when do we start moving furniture? And I was like, just trust the process, please, because <laughs> if you don't have any sense, and this, this is so big, anytime I need to make a change, I come back to this. All your basics in life, like cleaning your house, decluttering, um, things like taking care of you, like Take a shower, eating, sleeping. Yeah. Getting your hair cut, like taking care of you is so fundamental. And I know it's like, oh, self care, put on your mask first. It's not even just that it's really understanding your own energy. And I tell people it's the difference between feeling in it and feeling mentally in it. And so my job at the beginning is to move from head to your full body. And then you can be in your house. Like then you're really here because there are a lot of people and myself included, you find yourself watching social media, taking in data and the energy goes right up to your head and above your head. Right. And then all, and then the higher realms of spiritual work. And then it's like, but I can't actualize anything. And it's about bringing things down and some like simple things to do, like really paying attention to the idea of washing your floors, vacuuming, paying attention to your floors, grounding, getting into your home, touching things. Even if someone cleans for you, tidying up yourself, this is such a great way to get more out of here and into the full body and then things are easier. But 100,000% basics, basics, basics. And it's, it is so simple, but it doesn't mean anyone does it. Whenever I poll people, and I'm sure you've had this experience, if you poll people, ask people, how many of you have had enough to drink water today? Just listening to this. How many of you have slept enough last night? How many of you, you know, did ate something that made you feel good? Forget about healthy, not healthy, just made you feel good. Like just these, how many people are breathing deeply enough? Like these basic things that, and then we just skip past them and we go, I want to transcend. I want to actualize my highest potential. And it's like, that's awesome. Let's start with drinking water. Like I have to work on this stuff myself. And so I just really appreciate you saying that because I think it's just so skipped over and not prioritized. Well then, cheers to the basics because we've all got our mason glass jars of water. This is how you know you've embodied the make sure you stay hydrated energy when you carry around these things. You know, it's it's you're you're so right. It's 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 the basics that will always give you the most. When everybody talks about the 80-20 rule and putting 80% of your effort in like 20, it's the basics. It's always the basics. I mean, Michael Jordan said, he's like, I'm just really good at the basics. Like that's really what it always is gonna come back to. You know, whether you're in a relationship or whether you're, it's financial stuff, it's always really basic things. I'm curious though, when we're talking about your environment and making your environment more your own, what do you say to the person who travels a lot? We've been traveling a lot lately. We're living out of sometimes more of a car, sometimes an Airbnb, sometimes it's a hotel. Is there anything that we can bring into that space just to make us make it feel a little bit more ours and sort of clear out the energy of maybe who was there before we were? I think that's an awesome question for anyone traveling, even if you haven't moved into your home yet. Some people live in their home for 10 years and haven't really fully moved themselves in. Uh, one really excellent thing to do is exactly what you said, clear some energy that is not yours and personalize it. So I like to talk to spaces. I think it's it sounds funny but it's a really good way to, even if you don't believe you're talking to your house, to get your intention out into the universe. We're in like high Gemini time, like lots of communication, like get your, get your intention out there. Just say hello to the space. 
I'm going to be staying here for a week. I, I know I moved in a long time ago. I haven't introduced myself. Please show me how I can make myself more at home and take care of you better. And I intend to make this the best place that I possibly can. That's like such a simple thing to do and have an ongoing dialogue. I know a lot of people who've started doing this and they feel already more in their space, but also just stating out loud, like I want to respect this environment is a beautiful intention because then you start treating the environment like a living organism that it is. It's like a full energy system. So every time you're moving into a new place, anytime you're entering an environment, it's full of energy and influence. So clearing some of that stuck energy could be as simple as opening windows. It could be as easy as kind of airing out all the blankets, fluffing all the pillows. That's like some simple, basic, no burning anything needed, perfect thing to do. You can also get some bowls of sea salt. So if you're traveling, you could always pick up some salt and throw a bowl of sea salt in whatever area. Sometimes I like to do it on nightstands. That's very, very helpful. You can also just walk around and clap. I don't want to clap too loud to aggravate people, but you can clap in the corners of every room with the windows open. That also helps. A lot of times if you're in a hotel, if you're in an Airbnb, you can't burn a lot of things. It's not safe to burn a lot of things. But in your own home, if you wanted to, you could go a little bit further. You could burn some candles. You could burn herbs. But I want to stress that all that stuff, just like we were talking about, is like higher up and like the icing on the cake. Uh, and it's not the cake itself. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's all these fundamentals of making yourself known in the space, clearing out that stagnant air. Forget about energy, air, like getting air moving. If you have fans, if you have any sort of air conditioning, anything, just get things moving for a little while. And that I think can open things up a lot. I think that's such a great way to share about how you are in relationship to your environment. Like any good drug, the set and setting is the most important part. And so your environment plays a huge factor in how uh, stressed you feel mentally, emotionally, and if you're in that fight or flight experience based on your surroundings alone. So what would you say is maybe some misconceptions about feng shui? Like you said, it's not, it's not just, you know, don't put your mirror in front of the bed. Like, what are some of the misconceptions that people have that you could shine a light on? Because I love your perspective and your self-proclaimed weirdoness. Like, you are in the right family because I'm like, oh, I do all those things. Like, walk around clapping in all the corners. Like, get out of here, shoo shoo. So, I, I love that. And I talk to the hair in the salon. So, yeah, you're... You're right at home, my family. <laughs> I love that so much. I'm really actually into the spirituality of hair, just as a side note, like the idea, like I, it's why I stopped cutting my hair for so long. And I was like, okay, I have to like really get this together and <laughs> start. But I, um, Fabulous. I love, so misconceptions are, I want to just couch this properly because people believe what they believe. Some people believe that the tradition and the way that it's always done is the way that it should continue to be. And I respect and honor that. However, I know that in our modern world, a lot of feng shui does not translate. For instance, a lot of it is very culturally based, depending on it started as Vatsu and then it moved to become more, it's sort of morphed into feng shui and then became more western feng shui in the western world but there are different schools different ways of practicing i don't believe in luck in that you know i don't believe that purple in a corner creates luck i don't believe that facing a certain direction on a compass creates luck if you believe that so be it but i'm here to tell you it doesn't have to be that way and that was a lot of the testing that I did for all those years and continually, like we're always testing different hypotheses. But if you go into enough homes of people with extremely high net worth and you see that their money area does not look like feng shui says, and they are still wildly prosperous and they have clutter and they're still wildly prosperous, you have to ask yourself, is this actually true? 
And so what I found was that the core concepts of feng shui and a lot of the design principles hold up really beautifully over time. But the core concepts are not what's taught. What's taught is what's above them, which is people's ideas about how to implement them. And people's ideas can get very dogmatic. They can get mixed up in different religion and spiritual thinking. They can also get into the realms of fortune telling. And there's even a form of feng shui. I don't know if people know about this, but you get like sort of a printout of like every lucky day and bad day and bad health and bad this and good this. And I could never imagine telling someone that. Like, I don't believe it. And just like I didn't believe when someone handed me, you know, all these pills and said I had to take them forever, some things just don't ring true. And it never, it was one of the reasons why I had such a hard time getting into feng shui in my early time, because I was like, this is so much. And it doesn't feel, it feels really hard and really difficult and really just restrictive and expensive and how am I gonna buy all to, you know, I didn't have any, you don't need money to do this guys. You don't need tons of money. You don't need to redecorate your house. That's a big misconception. You don't need to do things you don't like. You don't need Buddha sculptures unless you like them and want them. You don't need giant crystals or any crystals. It's such, I think that whole veneer, that whole misconception is that it has to look like a zen minimalist space or that you have to get rid of everything you love you can't have extra things you can't have creativity you can't have any i am the complete opposite i feel that i think the greatest thing that you can learn about feng shui is that your environment is truly an extension of your energy field and it is the most powerful influence you have in your life all day long all the time and so Going back to that question about how can I personalize an environment, even just bringing some photos with you when you travel around or just putting some photos out or little pieces of art, crystals, things that you love, that helps you to get anchored more in the space and adjusting things that don't really work for you if it's a temporary space, but in your home right now, like just if for anyone listening to this, it could be as easy as just looking around and going, I'm sick of seeing this. This doesn't make me feel good. And um, that doesn't either. And none of it's clutter, because clutter is usually like the one thing people know. And none of it's clutter, I just don't like it. I don't like where it is. I'm gonna try it somewhere else. That could be the first place to begin. And it's the most powerful place because what you're doing is starting to change that story in a profound way that you're home is telling you. We talk a lot about brain rewiring, rewiring your subconscious mind, changing your brain patterns. If you don't change your environment, things don't really change because you're sitting in the old while you're creating the new. And this is why I always say like home has been like that missing link for so many people and they come into my programs and they're like, all of a sudden, like everything clicked together, everything works. And I'm like, yeah, because you're not looking at the old while you're literally immersed in the old while you're mentally and trying to physically create the new. And so you get to switch that stuff. And when you do, so much clicks into place and all those mindset practices and your belief systems and everything else click into place. But imagine sitting in a room where you see something that makes you feel like you are poor. And so it doesn't matter how many times you affirm your abundance. It doesn't matter how many times you do this. You're literally sitting right next to it and you see it all day long. So it's much more of an influence than the times that you say your affirmations. And this is why I keep telling people like, please don't skip environment because you don't need special things to fix it. And you can make such quantum leaps. You know, it sounds a lot of what you're saying is your mental environment is the first place you need to start before you go painting the walls and putting plants in there. Although I'm a big fan of those things. I am interested because so much of the work you talk about relates to mindset. And when we talk about these rituals, it really is like, I love your perspective on, we can do all the rituals, pull the cards, paint the hair, read the book, light the incense. Like we can do all those rituals, but it's the energy and the intention and the belief that you bring to it. 
One of the things you've shared is how you used your own belief and your own visualization to manifest yourself into Stanford. Can you talk about how your mindset played a role in opening a door that might seem impossible to someone else, as well as getting your name into major publications? You've had you have a really beautiful resume. So how would you say your belief and mindset shaped and played a part of that? Because obviously your thoughts create your reality. So you did this. Were you aware you were doing this or was this just because you're magical and then you realized it. <laughs> uh, no, early on, I, it's, it's really interesting. I, my dad was, uh, my dad went to jail. He was a mob lawyer and he wound up going to jail when I was, I think seven or eight and he got out when I was 12. So by the time I was nine, 10, he started sending me, he didn't go to a real jail. He went to like a country club prison where they send people who don't like these types of people where he was doing yoga and reading self-help books and like came out looking better than ever. It was like he literally went to some boot camp and then like came out like fit, not a drug addict, not an alcoholic. Well, debatable, but he was like in the best shape of his life. And he was reading all the things. And this was the 80s. So I was getting just like all the early self-help books sent to me when I was 10, 11, 12. And when your dad sends you something and you know he's in jail, you think like, I better read this. And so it was always impressed upon me that there was something important about this. And I was like, oh. And then when he was out, all of a sudden he emerged with like this whole revolutionary life in San Diego, which, you know, like beautiful house, beautiful things. And I was like, how did he do that? What is he doing? Um, he was doing a lot of other things, uh, but that weren't so great. But he was the first time I really saw him as a young adult, like out free in the world, um, he was lifting weights and saying affirmations. And, you know, he was just this charismatic wild dude. And so he had like this whole universe of stuff he got really into doing wheatgrass shots and all these things. And he would take us to the bookstore when we would go visit. And I was in New Jersey, come out for the summer, and I come back with like all these self-help books and crystals and things. And, you know, it was totally random. I lived in Secaucus, New Jersey, which is like right outside of the Lincoln Tunnel and like bridge and like very bridge and tunnel. I was a tunnel girl. Um, and so I was, you know, this was not a thing in Jersey in the 80s to talk about this stuff. And um, my mom also would have tarot card readers over and do parties at the house and all this. So I was kind of, I had it from different angles. And um, I just latched on to this idea, listening. I was listening to Shakti Gawain's uh, cassette tapes and he would play them again and again in the car. And I would lay back in my seat while we were driving around and I would just visualize. And it was like, if you visualize, you can have it. And I was like, okay, if she says so. And when you're young, you don't have those thoughts of like, it doesn't work. I encourage everyone to do this with their kids because it's the earlier you do it, the better. And I'm glad I had that foundation because it showed me it does work. And so I started to really change things in my life by thinking about them and then going out and doing them. And I just felt I had like a secret weapon. I felt like I had a sword. I had a list of all the things I wanted in my drawer. I had it up on my wall. No one was doing this. Like this was really weird stuff. And it was also like, I was so all in committed and it worked and it kept working and it kept winning and it kept working and it kept winning until I had to actually manage my own life. And that's when I realized all my deficiencies where I had a really strong mind, but I didn't have actual practices to support and take care of myself. Like I, if I've stayed in academia for my whole life, I think I never would have had any rock bottom, but I never would have had the top either. You know what I mean? I would have just been like always good because I had a structure around me. And I think that's what a lot of people don't have. I think that's why people are attracted to the work I do because people do a lot of mindset. They do a lot of physical, but then they don't know how to manage the stuff around them. And so I had to like boot camp teach myself and then be able to do it. So I, yes, I mindset played a big part, but also it had its limitations when I didn't have structure. 
because it was there's stuff you have to do in the real world. You have to pay your bills. You have to go and navigate people you don't want to talk to and all these things that I was just so not used to. I, I was used to having my own universe and it was just really shocking to be out in the world like that. It's, it's fascinating how many skills you really need to succeed. I mean, there are a lot of things that you have to be good at and communication and dealing with people is such a big one, especially if you ever want to be successful. I hear so many people like, oh, I really don't like dealing with people. I, I want to be rich. I'm like, I don't know how you, I mean, good luck. I mean, best of luck, because if you don't become a people person, oh, well, I'm an introvert. You better be a damn good artist or you better be able to make music from your basement or something, because other than that, like it takes certain skills. And, and I'm, I'm curious, though, when you are having your own space and you create your own space, it's beautiful, it's you, it's everything that you want to desire. And then you add a partner to that space. How do you blend the two styles? How do you maybe accept more of what they've got going he's on? He's asking, how do we make not everything pink in this house is what he's really asking you. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that question. And honestly, I, I've been through this a lot. I have a lot of people, one person moves in with another or people just decide independently to get a house together. And then all of a sudden it's like, what do we do? And it has to be organic. But what I see not work is when one person says, you take care of that and I will just go along with whatever you say, because ultimately over time, the person who designed the place feels like it's my home. And the other person is like, eh. And you miss out on that deep, powerful connection, the power source of having a home, of being at home. So I really recommend blending the two styles together organically, because if two people work organically, two styles work organically, even if they're very different. And, you know, it's like yin and yang. And if people have like, they're very the same, fantastic. But if you're if you have very different aesthetics than your partner, I'm telling you, I've seen again and again and again, even when they're so far apart, it always comes together looking great. The most important thing is that it's it's not, it's very easy for one partner to just defer and just say, whatever you think, whatever you think. I just want you to be happy, whatever you think. And I consider this to be such a tell about the communication in a relationship when I look around and I see it's just one person and someone's lived together, they've lived together for a long time. And I'm like, I get it, but this other person's not happy. And secretly the other partner will usually confide in me and be like, I wish I could have more stuff. I wish I could have my art up. I wish I could, you know, or my stuff's in the basement or you, you start to hear these things pop up even, you know, the person who designed the place will tell me like, yeah, his stuff is, is, you know, mostly in like the, his studio and his office. And I'm like, does he want stuff in the living room? You know what I mean? Like, can we bring it out? So I like to see everyone represented because that's such a big part of feeling at home. And really when I see people who are so resistant, I start to wonder, not in a critical way, but just wonder about the dynamics of their relationship because there's something like so profound about being like, I can be at home, but you can't. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. So what does it say about us that you're like, I don't really want any pictures of us on the wall. And I went with three foot by four foot canvases. <laughs> Yeah, I knew that. I knew that when I married Britt that I was getting something extra. It wasn't. It wasn't like I, I was clueless about it. What I did in the beginning that I thought really helped because when we would walk into stores, Britt would point at this. She said, "Oh, do you like that?" And it was difficult for me to picture that in our environment. And so what I did was I got on Tumblr, just like you were saying before, because Tumblr was a thing. But it was before like Pinterest really kind of knocked it out of the park. So I would get on Tumblr and I would just send Britt photos of spaces that really spoke to me. And it's interesting because it's changed over time. You know, before I was into like really sleek, ultra modern type stuff. And at this point, I've gotten more like, I guess, you know, Chip and Joe messed us all up. Everyone's in the farmhouse now. But I mean, they're beautiful. They're, they feel so homey. And at this point in my life, like the farmhouse vibe is like such a deal. But sending Brit photos really allowed us to communicate in a way because I couldn't explain it in the same words. She's obviously very visual. She does, you know, doing hair and stuff like that. And so I, 
I'm like you talking about such a more academic. I'm, I'm the studier. I'm like the, I, I want to like test everything out and experiment a million times. And so for me, it was so much easier to just be like, oh, this space is really beautiful. And then she asked, but I asked the amazing question, what about this space is beautiful to you? Perfect. And I feel like that's sort of giving me the right words. You know, I'm like, oh, well, I like the way that this, this color mixes with that color or the positioning of things or just how the space would probably feel if you were standing in it. And so she's, we've gotten on the same page that way. And so Britt can go into a thing and be like, Chris is going to like that. Chris is not going to like that. He's definitely going to disagree with me. This is a hundred percent a yes. You know, like there, there's so many and things. And I still that, keep getting tassels, even though I know you don't uh, like tassels. Tassels. I don't know what it is about tassels, but those, those have to go. Absolutely <laughs> have to go. <laughs> And, and There's it's just okay something to you have a disagreement. Say, tassels are one. <laughs> You know, tassels, disagreement about these little things. There's nothing wrong with that. But fundamentally, I think you guys work incredibly well together. And I think that's a beautiful way to go about setting up a space. And, you know, there are those things where, you know, I don't want pictures of us. I'm going to put giant pictures of us up. That's a beautiful thing, though. It's not you didn't just put pictures of yourself up. You put pictures of both of you up. So to me, it's that is really amazing and yes i feel like there's always a, an opportunity for people to express everyone in the house even kids like i see a lot of homes that are very adult and the kids have like their room and i'm like um give the kids at least like a seat that they can sit in like a, a little chair that's their height like something put some cushions on the floor something so that everyone feels at home. And it isn't like, I have this one little space and then I have an adult house. I think that's such great advice to make sure everyone's equally represented because if you're all in the same roof, then you all equally deserve the same amount of space and energy that you can recharge in. So speaking of recharge, I'm kind of curious, listening to you share and talk, what is your day-to-day self-care routine look like? Is that like I wake up and start in the morning or is this an intentional throughout the day or like what what does that look like for you? Uh, it's a really good question and it's very intense right now. It's It's gotten intense in a good way. Um, I've learned so much. I went through this last year, I went through this huge dental alignment and alignment is a big thing when we're talking about home and manifesting and life and everything. And so now I am doing so much alignment for my body and like workouts I've never done and all sorts of things. So I wake up and usually almost instantly I do my Buddhist practice, which is usually anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour, an hour and a half long, depending. Um, I'm trying to push my schedule earlier and earlier. I got into like this very big hole of staying up till two and getting up at like nine, which is not really great um, for your productivity, but it was fun for me. But I am definitely uh, getting up earlier, but not, I don't get up at five. And this is sort of my optimal, like between seven and eight, do my Buddhist practice and usually bounce on the trampoline that is beside me, a rebounder for like 10 minutes. Sometimes I do affirmations while I bounce. Uh, I make giant smoothie and uh, take a bunch of functional nutrition. And then um, and then I start working. I And working is usually fun stuff. So I'm doing this, I'm talking to you guys, I'm writing, I'm doing podcasts and making content. So it's all fun, but I'm making stuff. Basically I'm producing stuff throughout the day and teaching sometimes. But then like the self-care comes in with all the breaks that I take. So super long walk every day, as often as I possibly can, or Pilates, um, drinking as much water as possible. And I do castor oil wraps, which has been so incredible for aligning my body. I just love them so much. So usually at some point in the day, I'm wrapping myself in castor oil and I have this little belt thing with Velcro that I got from Amazon. And that makes me feel just incredible. Great for apparently your liver, your lymph, all of this. Uh, I do a lot of face and, and exercises and like myofacial exercises. This is part of alignment. Learning so much about my tongue posture. So I've been doing a lot of like 
mewing um, and all of those things, which has been really helpful. And this all gets kind of woven into my day. I do the five minute energy routine from Donna Eden pretty much every day because I could just fit that in wherever I do it. And then I usually will do some sort of energy cleansing at home or some sort of brightening or magnetizing, whatever kind of strikes me at the moment. I have cards everywhere. And so I'll usually, your cards are the most beautiful though. Like look at how beautiful for those of you who are like actually able to see it there. The edges of them are even epic. Um, and so I'll usually pull a card or do something like that as well throughout the day. And, um, and then in the evening, I have like a very elaborate evening routine. So like I said, I do another long stretch of Buddhist practice and a bunch of other like fascia stuff. Like I'm, again, all this stuff about body that I didn't know or care about before. Uh, foam rolling, more fascia work, more self-massage, um, reflexology. I'm learning ear seeds right now from a student in my feng shui school. It's really exciting. So all of that gets woven into my day. So I do a lot of different things, but ultimately I don't do anything rigorously. It all kind of falls in as it falls in. And that's what I encourage people to do. You can get so, I don't perfectly do everything. I don't remember to do castor oil every day. I don't remember to do everything every minute. But I am a big believer that if you can just incorporate those five minute practices, 10 minute practices, at a break, when you're sitting in your car, whatever it is, it works the same as if you made it into a giant ritual. It works the same and you'll just be more consistent and you won't be overwhelmed. I don't want anyone to feel like self-care is a job. Everything that I'm doing is serving an intentional purpose. Like I said, I learned about my body alignment, my jaw alignment, my face, everything. I learned some my teeth so many things that have prompted me to have all these new rituals that I never considered before, I didn't even know about. And so I think it's really tailoring what you do to you in my best advice I could give. And don't do what everyone else does just because it's popular. Tailor what you do to actually what you need. Um, visualization is always a part of every single day. It's kind of a given. I actually learned something. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this, but I'm going to share this wild book. I wish I had it to show you guys, but it's called The Magic of Psychotronic Power. And I don't know if you've ever read it, but it'll blow your mind. It's so crazy cool. So I've been doing visualizations. It's a, an offshoot of the Silva Method, which I've been doing for years. And it's wild. And so I've been incorporating more of that into those five minute, 10 minute breaks none of what I do is super elaborate. I don't have the time and energy to go to, like, I'll, I'll do things online, but I don't really have the time to like put myself in hardcore, long, intense rituals all day long. I'm, I, are you in love or not? Like she literally just like described your entire Listen, day, your you... entire day, starting with the freaking rebounder. I'm like laughing. He's on to me every day. Did you do your 10 minutes on the rebounder, babe? Have you done your t are you an Aquarius by the way? Like what is the deal? Like, I think you just you know, met your twin. Virgo. I'm so happy right now. I'm so happy. <laughs> That's a twin right there. Well, I think you said it best and just giving yourself the flow and flexibility of what do I need now? That's always what I teach at my retreats. Every morning when we wake up together and start our movement practice, I always invite them to close down and get clear on what their intention is for the day. And that starts with the question, what do I need right now? And then That's I encourage beautiful. you to ask that throughout the day, because that changes based on your hormones, the, where the moon is and like how much sunlight you're getting. <laughs> yeah. My, my thought with uh, sort of the self-care way. And I do a ton of stuff like you do. And I've always done it my whole life. Just intuitively, so always. It, I, 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 it's one of those things I never skip. But for me, I think of self-care in the same way it was the old um, Abraham Lincoln quote. If I had five hours to chop down a tree, I'm going to spend the first four hours sharpening the blade. Self-care to me is that sharpening the blade. Because when I show up or when I'm wanting to do something, I'm showing up as like 150%. Meanwhile, the person who didn't do any self-care, while they may have worked a longer amount of hours than me, their actual work production is not very good. 
because they didn't sleep enough at night. They woke up and immediately caffeinated themselves. They didn't move. They uh, got on the phone and just started looking at the phone for five hours. And so suddenly their, their day's half gone there. And I'm not doing any of those things. That's so the important about what you brought up about intention, because you can control your day. You are the one deciding whether you do this in the morning or that in the morning, or you skip or you make an excuse. You control every single bit of that. And so if you want to see huge improvement in your life, besides the visualizations, which you are a thousand percent correct, if you want to succeed in your life, you have to start visualizing. Like if you're not doing that, you're shooting yourself in the foot and there's almost zero percent chance you can succeed. It would have to be absolute luck for you to succeed if you're not doing some sort of like good visual. If you can't picture in your head a future where you've succeeded at whatever you want, there's no way you're going to get it. I mean, there's absolutely no way. But if you can stack on top of that some form of self-care, where it is breathing, whether it is a little bit of yoga, whether it's something, doesn't matter, a walk in the woods, if you whistle and, and skip a little bit, whatever the hell it means for you or laugh, it's anything. But if you'll start adding those couple of practices in your life. You mean the basics? The fucking basics. It's always so damn beautiful and we're always ignoring them. The second we get on any kind of high level call with somebody, it doesn't matter if the person's a billionaire. They get on the call, I'm asking the same simple questions. When's the last time you laughed? When's the last time you made love? When's the last time you're drinking a gallon of water a day? When's the last time you slept correctly? And like, if you're not hitting any of those things, like there's probably gonna be some kind of issue. Like there's some kind of an energy depletion, a leakage that you're having where you're not doing what you should be doing. Like you, it, it should, life should be half as hard as you're making it if you're hitting the basics correctly. I love that. Amen. That's beautiful. That really hits for me. I, I tell people often don't, get out of bed if you try if you have trouble following through throughout the day before you literally step out of bed do something for yourself like you could write a list you could speak out loud what you want like Brittany said like you could start with like what do I need I love that like this is it's just you don't you don't have to make it hard but it makes such a big difference like you said you could take control of your day a little bit one of the reasons I love space is it exteriorizes things we get into our head and it becomes sort of circuitous but if you start changing your environment it's easy to manage like you don't have to guess you're like i definitely don't like where that is i could definitely change that and as you start changing it kind of opens doors for you to make bigger changes in your brain as well and i just and your energy and everything so um yeah, you guys are amazing. I love you. Yeah, and you're the greatest couple. Like, I love the whole dynamic between you. Mm, thank you so much. You really are such a bright light. And I hope that my feng shui card in the Shine from the Inside Oracle passes your test. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to see what what we can take away. Can I pick a card for what Ooh, we can all take please. away what an honor. today? And I'm just so excited because I feel like... You are a catalyst for me, definitely. Brittany, I'm telling you, like changed my day and changed my outlook on things. And so here we go. So thankful. Pick one. Get back to nature and reconnect to your hippie roots. I love Ooh. that. It's so true. That's such a great card for us as the weirdos that didn't fit into the muggle world. You know, it's really, we're coming into a time just meeting you at Unite the Light and hearing that you almost didn't show up for a very solid reason, but still the universe had you show up to be in the right place, to connect you with the right community so that we could do this together so that we don't have to hide behind closed doors. We can truly shine from the inside and not be afraid to let our wisdom be seen, heard and speak the truth so that we can actually create the transformation that we chose here to come, you know, like why we came here to create that, um, the, the real change really and the transformation from within and then as a collective. So with that in mind, I would love to know, like if you had one last message and you could leave it on a billboard, what would your message be? Nothing's that serious. Mm, I love that. I love that. That's for so someone, good. And then, coming from someone who made everything serious for so, so long um, and then realized, you know, with many, uh, we'll say like brushes with the other realms, you know, I have very big health scares and big things that I've talked about and everything else. At the end of the day, nothing's that serious. Like, you don't like me? Okay. Like, 
I, I love to talk about it and work it out. But like, if you just are a hater online, I don't care. I don't, I really don't care about a lot of things. And that created a lot of freedom. I want to be the best person I can, but like nothing is that serious. Nothing's worth stressing about so much. And some things are just inevitable. And so I think if there was more levity, it would be so much easier to get more done when everyone's so panicked about so many things and have like they go to like the worst, I would go to the worst possible case scenario that almost never happens. And so, yeah, nothing's that serious. You might as well have a lot of fun doing all this stuff. I love that so much. And I feel like that lends to the last question. And what does living an elevated life mean to you? Being yourself, like for real, um, like unadulterated and, um, and having the courage to do that these days because someone is not going to like it. <laughs> someone, uh, you know, there's this only so much middle way that you just really being yourself is so elevating. You can see it in people's eyes. And I don't care what people believe in. You can believe in anything you want. When I see like a deep heartfelt conviction from people to what they believe in, even if it's radically different from anything I think, I am so completely like yes to them. It doesn't, I don't have to say yes to their idea, but there's a beauty in the fact that we're all different and we can all be really self-expressed. And when we are, it's just like, oh, yes. And that's like the point, that, that is the point of the work that I do. I always tell people it's about actualizing your highest self. Your home is just one big model uh, that you can work on to change, but it's all about that, like being more you not being somebody else. And that's why we sat at the same table together because clearly we were meant to live this elevated life together. Dana, thank you so much for all your wisdom. Where can our followers find more of this magic from you? Um, everywhere at the Tao of Dana, T-H-E-T-A-O-O-F-D-A-N-A. And my website is fengshuidana.com and I'll send you all links and things. So if people want to follow along YouTube, there's a podcast, there's uh, programs, there's a school, there's all sorts of things. And I think three or 4,000 blog posts. So there's a lot for you to explore. <laughs> No big deal. She's just been cranking out all that wisdom and you guys certainly don't want to miss it. Go follow her at the Dow of Dana on Instagram because I know I literally obsessed scrolled like while sitting there watching you on stage. Like I leaned over to your friend who was with you, who was like all pumped up. I was like, who is she? What's her? Can you type in her Instagram name over here? Like who I need to know who this woman is. So thank you for being such a bright light. Even when you didn't feel that way, you still shine. And that is a testament to your amazing soul. So thank you for being here on the podcast. We enjoyed it. And let us know how you enjoyed this episode by tagging us, sharing it, reaching out to us and letting us know your aha moment. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one. Peace. Peace.